I, li- I like trucks. I don't know about you. You like trucks? Yeah, cowboy trucks. Cowboy church that likes trucks. We got lots of trucks. My first truck was a uh, 2000 Ford, or first, not my first truck, my first diesel truck. Let me say that, diesel truck. I drove gas trucks all my life until I pulled a trailer up to Pennsylvania pulling a, uh, uh, it was a, a machine I had to take up from my father-in-law, and it could, it, I, I used my boss's truck, and it was a 7.3 diesel, and I was like, man, this thing pulls so good. Once you pull with a, a diesel pickup, there's nothing like it, you know? You'll never go back to gas. At least I, that's just me, as far as pooling-wise. Um, so uh, I bought this truck, and it was, it was a wonderful truck, but I was new to diesels. I had no idea what about diesels. And my father-in-law had come down from Pennsylvania, and he was in the market for a new truck. And you might have remembered about 10 years ago, there was a truck on the bypass. It was beautiful. It was white and sat up big. It was, it was really, really, really pretty. Just a nice look. One of the nicest trucks I've ever seen, still to this day. And I told my father-in-law, I kind of goaded him a little bit. I said, boy, you'd look good in that truck right there. You ever done that to somebody? Say, oh, you'd look good in that truck. And I went to work down in Jefferson City. When I got home from coming home from Jefferson City, you know what was sitting in my driveway? That truck. I'm new, I was new to diesels. I didn't know. He drove that truck about a year, and it had a 6.0 diesel in it. And, I, and everything started going wrong with it. And <laughs> I went down on the son-in-law list. Bunk, kabunk, kabunk, kabunk. I'm telling you. It was, it was bad. Blown intercoolers, head gaskets, EGR valves, oil coolers, blown injectors. You name it, it went wrong. And with every blow, I could just hear Dennis in Pennsylvania go, Oh, Tim, I'm going to kill him if I see him, yeah? I was the only son-in-law he had, and I was still on the bottom of the list. <laughs> I was. It, was. it was worse than the time that I took his box truck and hit a railroad bridge with it. Yeah, I did that. That's right. That happened just once. With this truck, it kept happening over and over and over again. So, but I didn't know. I was new to diesels, and I didn't know at the time that there's something you can do to a 6.0 called bulletproofing them. You can, you can do all kinds of work, but it takes a lot of work, but you can, you can bulletproof them, and then they're, they're supposed to be a good truck. I don't know personally. I, don't, I, 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 stayed, I ran away from him when I saw one after that. I, after hearing him grumble at me for that many times, I was like, I ain't going to want nothing a part of a 6.0 diesel. But you can bulletproof them. And I was going to call this message this morning, I was going to call it Bulletproof in Your Family. But I don't know how that would work, especially with YouTube. They'd probably censor me somehow. So... I changed it to flood-proofing your family, flood-proofing your family. How many is thankful for your personal salvation? I am. There's nothing more precious than it. It really isn't. To know that the creator of the universe loved me so much, he loved you so much, that he sent his son, his only begotten son, that he would take my place. There is nothing more precious on earth than your personal salvation. It really is. You need to treasure it this morning. You need to, to just hold on to that and thank the Lord for it and, and honor it and, and just hold on to it. But right behind my personal salvation, you know what's behind it? My family's salvation. It really is. I want my family to get to heaven. I can't imagine being in heaven and one of my family members don't get there. It's so important. When we did Vision Quest yesterday, the word family came up so many times. I know one of the things that God has instructed and, and placed on our heart as a vision here at this church and this ministry is to build families, to flood-proof families, because there's a flood coming. There's a flood, not of water this time. Remember I talked about it last week. The, the, he gave us the rainbow. He said he'd never flood the earth again, but he's going to burn it next time. And I, I want to flood-proof my family. I want to, I want to make sure. I'm concerned. I, I, love, 
I want my family to be successful in this life. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm okay. I, I, I'm, I want that. You should too, right? But how much more is it important that they make success in heaven? Amen? You can win all the accolades here on earth. You can do the best of what you can do here on earth. But if you don't make heaven, and if your family don't make heaven, it's been all in vain. So we need to to look at it. I want to show them. I want to live daily to show my family that, yeah, I want to be successful in this life. I want to, and, and I believe that God will do that. He'll honor it. He said he'd bless everything I put my hand to if I walk uprightly before him. So that's earthly success, but more than even earthly success, I want to build them for heaven. I want to build them. Amen? I want to make it so attractive for, for heaven. It's like a steak dinner, the best steak dinner you ever saw compared to a moldy P, B, and J. Earthly success looks like a moldy P, B, and J compared to that beautiful steak dinner. And that's exactly what it looks like this morning. That's exactly the way we got to treat it. And, and so if you got your Bibles, go to Hebrews 11 with me. It's called the, this is called the Hall of Fame of Faith. You know, God has a Hall of Fame, or a Hall of Faith, we should say, right? He's got a Hall of Fame of Faith, and in this, there's two people I want to look at, and this first one, everybody knows. It's Hebrews eleven seven. It says this. It says, it was by faith, say faith. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that have never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received righteousness that comes by faith. You receive everything we, we, we obtain for heaven by faith. Everything that you're going to lay up in heaven is done by faith. you got to see this this morning. Noah's life mission, his life's mission was to get his family to heaven. Is that your life mission this morning? I got my own personal salvation, but after that, I'm going to do my best to get my family. And you know what? You're my family. We are the family of God. I'm going to do everything I can to get as many people that I can to heaven with me. Because when we become a child of God, when we get adopted into the family, by believing in Jesus, we become family. You may not like each other, but you're family, right? You may, you may have odds with crazy Uncle Bob. or uh, I say it all the time. We're not called to like each other. We're called to love each other. You may have differences with your family, family, but you want them all to go to heaven. Amen? So it's by faith Noah flood-proofed his family. The Bible says, Bible says specifically that Noah had the faith. His family didn't have the faith. Noah had the faith. That's important to see. All it takes is one. If one will stand up and dig his heels in and say, I've got faith for my family. Amen? I stand here this morning because I had parents that had faith. Do you understand that? I had grandparents. My, my, great, my grandfather on my dad's side was a minister, and he had faith. And my father had faith, and my mom had faith. I've got faith for my family. You need to have faith for your family this morning. It's handed down. Handed down faith. You may say, well, that's an Old Testament story, Tim. We're living in new times, New Testament. Let me tell you something. The story of Noah, this really dawned on me. This, God made this so clear to me this week. The story of Noah, it might be one of the most relevant stories we have in the Bible right now. And the longer the Lord tarries, the more relevant it becomes. Think about this. Jesus said this. He said in Matthew 24, 37, he said, when the Son of Man returns, he hasn't returned yet, 
But when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. In those days before the flood, people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time that Noah entered his boat. As Noah was walking up the ramp with his family, there's families all around them that were partying it up. They had no clue what was going to happen. They had never seen rain before. They had never seen a boat before probably to, to float. And, and as he's walking up the ramp, they had no clue. They were eating, drinking, having parties. They didn't realize in verse 39, it says, people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be in the coming of the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes. Eating, drinking, parties, weddings. God wants you to enjoy life. Don't get me wrong. That sounds like it's a downer there. But he wants you to be prepared for the flood. He wants you to be prepared for eternity more than anything. Genesis 6, 5 says this. It's more description of Noah's day. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally on evil. And then skip down to verse 11. It says, Now the Lord saw the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. And God observed, observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on the earth was corrupt. Think about this. Noah's society, they didn't have internet, they didn't have TV, they didn't have social media, they didn't have music platforms, they didn't have Hollywood, they didn't have newspapers, they didn't have magazines, they didn't have any of those things, but their thoughts were continually on evil. How much more, when he said it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah, how much more is men's minds are constantly on evil today? Think about this. I, I'm, I'm just playing it out there. It's as plain as the nose. It really is as plain as the nose on your face. We got to be ready. We got to be ready. And I know that one thing that this, this ministry, I'm going to say it again, is we're called to lead families. We're called to lead families. Prepare them for what God's coming. So I was looking at the story of Noah, and I wrote a few things down. You might want to take some notes. Some things that, that, that I see in Noah's story that's real plain if you look at it, if you want to flood-proof your family. <laughs> Are you ready? Turn to someone and say, buckle up. Buckle up, buttercup. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get a little rough. It says, by faith, Noah built a boat to save his family. Here's the first thing that I see. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work to save your family. To have faith for your family, it's a lot of work. I, I don't know how God did it, but when God rolled out the plans, you ever seen Evan Almighty? Yeah, it's funny. But I don't know how he did it, but when God rolled out the plans for this ark, could you imagine being Noah? I don't know if, if, if the Lord just kind of rolled it out on a piece of paper for him, I could, you know, or, or if he just gave it to him in a dream and he had to write it all down. But could you imagine? You didn't, have, you didn't have chainsaws. You didn't have Milwaukee tools, right, Austin? Milwaukee didn't exist back then. You just had hand tools, and you see a boat that is 450 feet long, 75 feet is it tall, 50 foot wide, layer upon layer upon layer inside, and you think... And God gives you this plan and says, Noah, I need you to build this. On top of raising your own food and raising your family and, and, and the homestead to doing all the things that you're doing, I need you to build a boat. Man, I don't know too much. I'd probably go curl up in a corner somewhere and say, oh, it's too much. I can't do that. Imagine the work. You know, people speculate it probably took him, they think it took him like 100 years to build this thing. It was 100 years before the time he got the word till the time the flood came. I know that for sure. And I would probably think he was probably building the whole time. But to be handed that kind of project, why would we think that we're any different today that it's going to not take work to get our family to heaven? Why would we think that? Have you ever stopped and just thanked God for Noah? and his family, and all the work that they did. 
He saved all mankind. He not only saved his family, he saved you. Do you realize you owe your life to Noah who worked his buns off <laughs> in his family? Didn't he? Just to be honest with you, think about it. If he didn't build the boat, they'd have swam a long time. <laughs> so I thought about this. You know, if you want to save your family, it's work. It's work to teach your family the Word of God. It takes time. It takes effort to put the Word of God in them, doesn't it? I can imagine when Noah rolled it out and said, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine if Kathleen was one of his kids. That'd be great. <laughs> I should have gave you to Noah for a while. <laughs> We might have had a different story. <laughs> but he rolls it out, and there's Noah, and, and their kids' eyes just rolled. Oh, come on, God, Dad, really? We're going to build this boat? Are you serious? How long is this going to take? You know I've got my best shows are coming on, right? I really want, I really want, I've got this thing I need to do, God, Dad. And, and and just imagine, you know, it's, it's it's hard enough to get your family to come together for a devotion sometimes. Oh, Dad, are we going to read another devotion? But it's work. It's work. If you want your family, if you want to flood-proof your family, you need to put some work into it. I'm calling dads out. I'm calling you're the leaders of the home. We need some men to step up. You need to step up in your family. Amen. And you need, you need to be the leader. You need to say, hey, guys, let's get together. Noah was the leader. He called Noah and said, get him together. We're going to do this. Teach your family the ways of the Lord. It takes work to do that. It's easy to go along with the flow. It's easy to go along with this world and their customs and their design. It's easy to go. But to go against it and say, no, no, we don't do that because this is what the Lord says. Amen? Amen? You don't walk out of the house looking like that because this is what the Lord says. Amen? We, we, as for me and my house, we go to church on Sunday. You, you, you know, you, you're going to live on my roof. You can go to church with me. You say, well, I don't have no control over them. Do you feed them? Do they wear clothes that you bought? Then you can say, you won't go to church with me. When it's first, first as your kid, if your kid ever gets up and says, Dad, are we going to church this morning? You've already lost the war. There should be no question. We're going. Amen? Boy, it's good preaching, isn't it? <laughs> I, write, I write this down. This is, this is good. There'll come a day, listen to me, when your kids won't do what you say but they'll do what you lived in front of them. Set that example. They're, when they're little, you can tell them, you be quiet or you go this way or you go that way or you do this. They'll listen to you. But there'll come a day, you're not going to be able to talk to them like that. But they'll do what you did. If you made the Word of God a priority, they'll come back to it. If you made uh, living for the Lord a priority, they'll come back to They may stray for a while, but they'll come back because if you don't have enough faith to put some action into it and put some work into it and put some sacrifice into it, that's not a faith worth having. And your kids know that. Boy, that's good. It's good preaching this morning. Ain't that great? You, can't, you got up on Sunday to hear this in great encouraging word. <laughs> It's work. It's work. Here's something I saw about the ark. You know, the ark was tarred on the outside as well on the inside. Right? It was tarred. It was pitched. It said the Bible says it was pitched on the outside as well as the inside. You know what that shows me? You can't live one way at church and not live the same way at home. You, gotta, you can't have a double standard if you're going to have faith for your family. What you live publicly, you need to live privately. And if you live it, you can leave it. But if you don't live it, you ain't going to leave it. Good deal. Praise the Lord. Right? <laughs> and it's work to be different. 
It's work to be different. Could you, and no one had to tell Noah's family they were different. No one has to tell me my family is different. A lot of people come to me and say, your family's different. I'm like, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do they come to you? You need to, you need to ask yourself, am I different? Or do I fit in so much with this world that they say there's nothing different about you? But nobody had to tell Noah's family that they were different. They were the crazy family at the end of the street that was building a great big wooden box. Right? They were the fanaticals. They were the people that kept walking around saying, the flood's coming, the flood's coming. The whole time he's preaching, Jesus is coming. Now, that's why I, people look at me sometimes when I say, Jesus is coming. They look at you a little weird. I think it's one of the greatest witnessing tools. If you want a witnessing tool for this day right now, this day and age, when somebody says something about the bad that's going on in the world, you just pull it out. You pull out your card and say, Jesus is coming. You watch them. It, it, that, that word, G, just the name of Jesus will start will start something shaking in the atmosphere, but then you start saying, Jesus is coming. You add that to it, and they're like, oh, oh. I've, wa- I've, watched, I've watched sinners that the, the fear comes on them, and it's just a shade. You'll, you'll see it come across their face. And I'm not trying to scare everybody that I walk around, but I do need to warn everybody. You need to warn everybody. Jesus is coming. Greatest witnessing tool you have right now. It's the easiest time in history to witness. I don't care what they say. You got a self, you can make a little video and say, Jesus is coming, and send it to all your friends. Why ain't you? Think about it. If you really believe that there's a flood coming, you really believe that tribulation's right around the corner. I read the book. It's it's terrible. I, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go through the tribulation. Good. People probably walk by that great big wooden box, that 450-foot wooden box, and thought Noah's done flipped his lid. But Noah saw his family's salvation. Amen? Some people thought, well, he's, if, he, if, he was, if his story was written in today's society, today's time, People would have walked by and said, well, he's building the biggest storage storage container I've ever seen. I got a bunch of stuff I could put in there. But you know what Noah saw? He saw his eternal rewards of his family being laid up, the safety of his family that he's worked for, the work of his hands. I put this down. Real faith is working faith. Faith's not lazy. There's nothing lazy about faith. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna flood-proof your family, faith, salvation's free. But if you want to get your family there, let me tell you, you're gonna have to fight every demon because the devil is out for your children. And if it's not your children, it's your grandchildren. Amen. Here's the second thing I saw: got to get your family involved. Noah couldn't have built this boat by himself. There's no way he could have built that boat by himself. He had to get his family involved. Had to get him involved in working in the kingdom. You know, I was thinking about the work. I want to show you something because when you start talking about work, I know me. Okay, I'm just talking about me this morning. I know when someone talks about work, you know what happens to me? My selfish desire pops up and says, well, I, I want to do what I want to do. You ever done that? But let me show you something. This is something God showed me on the way to church this morning when I was looking over my notes. The Bible says as it was in the days of Noah, right? It will be coming as the Son of Man. But in Luke, it says this, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Well, we all know what Lot was about. We all know the Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what it, we know what the atmosphere was like, the morality of that time. There was sexual perversion of all kinds. But in Ezekiel 38, I had never saw this till about two years ago. And I was reading Ezekiel 38, and it says this, that in Sodom, there was an excess of idleness. Let that sink in. We can't even get people to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken right now. I use Kentucky Fried Chicken as an example a lot. 
they should give me a, some kind of sponsorship, shouldn't they? They should sponsor our church. But they can't. They can't get people to work at Kentucky Fried. There's so much idleness. You think, has there ever been another generation, ever, in history, that has been as idle as this generation? Has there? A hundred years ago, if you were idle, you wouldn't eat. Because the food just don't happen out of the, out of the field. We know that, right? Harvest don't walk its way to the barn. You got to get out there. You got to plant it. You got to reap it. So a hundred years ago, there was no idleness. Today's world is so idle. I have to constantly. I told this. I told this to Willie. I said I got to make sure my life that, that I don't. I don't become idle. I really believe that God gave the project of the boat to Noah to keep his family busy. There was so much wickedness and so much bad things going on that it's just too easy to join into. But if you got a purpose and you've got a plan and you've got a vision and you got a, you ain't got time to go out and carouse. Did you ever think about that? They were working. They were working to save their future. And I think that sometimes I, I, I get convicted because I'll just tell you, sometimes after I've done talk to people and I've studied and I've done, I just want to go home and sit in my recliner and flip through Facebook and, and look at all the different feeds. I'll just be honest with you. Excess of idleness. I pray God help me. Check me. Oh, me. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching at me. Amen? But at the same time, ask yourself, are we working? Are, are we working? Faith is not lazy. It's working. Get your family involved. You say, well, they're kids, the child labor law. <laughs> no. When, we, when we, we started treating children like children when they were teenagers, you know what? They'll grow up and be adult children. You got to train a child up to work. Work ethic isn't just someday you wake up at 14 years old and say, hey, I've got work ethic. You've taught them. You've put it into their life. You've showed them. And not just that you go out and do the work. This is where I'm guilty at, okay? This is where I'm guilty. I'm not talking about you. I just preach for myself. I'll tell you my scenarios. I'll, th I'll lay myself bare for you all, okay? And then I'll come to the altar later on if you want to. You can all pray for me. How's that work? But here's, here's this. Sometimes it's a bother to teach my kids. Because sometimes they won't, they won't, they, they just don't. It's a fight. First off, you got to hold them still to get it into them. And then, and then say, I can do the job faster. I can, I can do it faster if I just do it myself. You ever been there? Just, just move aside. I'll get it. I'll do it. It takes time to step back and say, okay, let me show you how it's done. Let me get you involved. You teach somebody, they'll forget. I put a post on this week. You teach somebody, they forget. You show them, and they might remember, but if you involve them, they'll never forget. They'll never forget. And we need to involve our kids in the work of the Lord. They need to see you involved in the work of the Lord. If you value what the Lord's doing here, or you value what the Lord's doing in your life, you get involved. You step up and say, I can do that. And there are no, no jobs too small. But then teach your children to do it. Bring them up. Because at 14, 15, and 16, if you wait that long to start teaching them, you've lost them. You've got to train them while they're small. I believe that with everything in me. Don't you? Can you see that? I just lay myself bare. That's just the way it is. I got good news, though. Turn to somebody say he's got good news. <laughs> it's never too late to start. Isn't that great? God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning when you wake up, His mercy is new. Don't ever think, well, I messed up and I've got to work my way back to God. I've got to work my relationship back to God. You know, God's not like me and you. Me 
if you wrong me bad enough, and you're the same way, don't, don't act like you're better than me. I know that right now. But if you wrong me, I'm going to sit back and say, well, they're going to have to prove that they earn my, my love and my respect back. But here's the, here's the amazing thing about God that I can never get over. Is when you come back to the Lord with a repentant heart, you say, I'm sorry. I don't want to do it. And I'm turning to you. Do you know, instantly, he restores that relationship. You don't have to crawl your way back to Jesus. He instantly will pick you up. Isn't that so good? That is so good. I've heard so many Christians, defeated Christians say, well, I, I just wish I could get back to where I was 10 years ago. You can. All you got to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry, and I'm coming back. Just like that prodigal son. He took everything of his inheritance. He took every bit of it. He squandered it all. He paid it for, he spent it on all kinds of terrible things that the Lord hated. But all he had to do was come back to his senses and step coming back. And the Lord ran, said, bring the best robe. He didn't say bring a second-handed one. He said, bring the best. He said, bring a ring. Put some shoes on his feet. He said, my son was dead, but now he is alive. Isn't that great? Boy, that's good news. Turn some of that's good news. So it's never too late to try to start saving your family and saving in, and floodproofing your family. Noah was 500 years old when he got the commission. Ain't nobody in here 500 years old. You don't even look 500 years old. I've seen people that are 100 years old. Boy, they look old. 500. Could you imagine? Wow. I forgot this point. It's too good to stop. Start, uh, yeah. To miss. Noah's family was about boat building, right? Could you imagine being trying to date one of his daughters? The requirements was they probably took him out to the wood chopping pile and say, Okay, let me see, let me see you make that into a plank. How fast can you do it, boy? Because this family's about building a boat. That's the way it is you need to be with your children. And your grandchildren. As soon as they say if they're dating somebody, they're seeing somebody, you ask them, do they love the Lord? Do they know Jesus? If they don't, you drop them like they're hot. Right? That's right. That's right, because we're about boat building. We're about Jesus. We're about working for the kingdom. Not this kingdom, the kingdom. Right? Here's the last one, and this is where the sermon is where it gets worth. Is the last thing if you want to if you want to flood proof your family, you got to get them to Jesus. You've got to get them to Jesus. I've heard it said and I agree, a sermon is not a sermon until you bring Jesus into the equation. And this is the biggest point of all. If you want to flood proof your family, you got to get them to Jesus. Hebrews 11:31, another person in the hall of fame. It says this, it says, it was by faith that Rahab, a prostitute, the prostitute, not a prostitute, said the prostitute. I just saw that. <laughs> it says, by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. For she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How about that? In the middle of all these great men that are listed that we look up to, Abraham and Noah and, and David and great men in the Bible, the Lord sticks somebody in there that the society sometimes says, well, I don't know about that. Rahab the prostitute. The story was, was they were going to take Jericho. The Israelites were on the other side of the river and they were, they were going to take Jericho and they sent some spies across and Jericho, that, that you remember the Jer Joshua fought the battle of Jericho? Remember that? The walls came falling down? That's the city. So they go in, these two spies, and they find Rahab's house. They go inside Rahab's house. I don't know why they went to the prostitute's house, but they were there. You, you figure that one out. And so they were there because it says she gave them a friendly welcome. It says that. So they were there. But the men of the city come along, and they said, what, what's up with the men? Where are they at? Bring them out. 
And she hit him. And she said this. She basically did this. She said, you saved my family, I'll save your bacon. And they said, okay, we'll do it. And what they did is they said, you take this, you get all your family in the house. We can't guarantee if they're outside of the house, they're going to die if they're outside of the house. But if you get them inside your house, and then you hang this red cord outside your window, when, 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 the, when we come and we come to attack, you're, you and your family will be saved. Remember this story? Remember that? You know, me and you, we've got something much greater than a red cord to put our hope and our trust in this morning. We've got the blood of Jesus. And I'm telling you what, if you'll just get your family in the house and you keep them in the house and you keep them close to the Lord and you get them to the house of the Lord and then you put your faith and you put your hope and you put your trust and everything that you have in Jesus, not in your goodness, but in Jesus and what he's done, he will take, he will save your household. I believe it with everything in me. Boy, you all are really excited this morning. But I'm preaching better than you're listening. I'm telling you, I know. I know what I'm talking about. Get them to Jesus this morning. Lift up Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Tell them what he's done for them. All the time. God can save anyone. Jesus can save anyone. His blood can make the vilest sinner clean. That red cord is outside that home. I tell you what, you need to make Jesus the banner of your home. Boy, it's good. Some of you might say, well, I ain't never done anything bad like Rahab. Let me tell you something. If we had a machine in this place that we're going to say, like, next week we're going to hook up your brain and we're going to display all your thoughts on this TV for everybody to see, I don't think anybody would come back. So don't tell me you don't need the blood of Jesus to cover your life and cover your heart. I love this because Rahab, Jesus, God used Rahab, and he actually came through Rahab, the lion. She was great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. God can use anybody if you just have faith for your family. But it takes work to get them in the house. Sometimes like herding cats or bumblebees to get them inside the house. But if you get them inside the house and you start telling them that Jesus is the one, you lift up Jesus to them. You tell them Jesus is the answer. That red cord outside of, of Rahab's window, I really believe with everything in me, it symbolized what Jesus did for us. Amen? It's so good. God can save those with a past. That's what the story of Rahab shows me. God can save those with a past. God can use those with a past. And God redefines those with a past. Aren't you thankful for that? You don't have to be defined by your past. Are you hearing me this morning? You're awful quiet. That's good. You don't have to be defined by the mistakes you made. Everybody makes mistakes, but if you'll put your hope and your trust in Jesus, he can redefine your future. Isn't that great? So good. Floodproof in your family. It takes work. It takes time. Get them involved. It's never too late. And put your trust in Jesus. Amen. If you would, just bow your heads with me this, this morning. I want to ask you, you're here for a reason this morning. There's no coincidence in a believer's life. There's just not. But maybe you're here this morning and you're not a believer yet. And you haven't given your heart and, your, your, and, and surrendered your life to Jesus. You've got to, it's, that's where it starts. That's where it starts with you, that personal relationship with Jesus. You can't save your family if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus yourself. You've got to st it's got to start with you. And this morning, if, if, if you say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus, I want to start, I want to I floodproof my family, but I know it starts with me. 
And that's you this morning. You say, I, I want to pray. Come this morning. I want to pray with you. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And here's the second part. If you say, I want to flood-proof my family, and there were some things as, as you were preaching and the Holy Spirit was bringing the message this morning that it, it really it, it spoke to my heart, and I want you to agree with me in prayer. If that's you this morning, come, I want to pray with you. God wants to flood-proof your family. I believe that with everything in me. The Bible says where two or three are gathered and we agree in Jesus' name it shall be done. I'm telling you, I know there's people that, that have kids that are lost, that are not serving the Lord. And, and, and you still sit there and thinking, well, I can just do it on my own. Let me tell you, you need, you need Jesus to come into, into agreement this morning. You know, you may not remember this message a year from now, but God will remember your response. I promise you that. Don't sit there if you've got kids that are far from God. You need the help of Jesus this morning. I believe you might, you're sitting in church. You might as well believe the whole word. The Bible says we're to agree in Jesus' name. I'm going to agree with you this morning. I'm willing to come alongside and agree that you have faith for your family. Welcome to Crossroads Cowboy Church Online. If you're watching this for the first time or maybe you've been watching for a while, and you felt the Holy Spirit during the message this morning stir your heart, and you want to give your life to Christ. You want to surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe He's been dealing with you for a while, or maybe it's just right now you have just felt His, His presence drawing you. It's as easy as this. You just, you, just, you just say, Lord, I'm sorry of my sins. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I surrender my life to you. I want to become a new person. I don't want to be the person I am right now. I want to become uh, a child of God. I want to, to do my, live my life for you. I, I, I can't, I've tried doing it on my own, and I can't do it anymore. And it's as simple, really as simple as that. I've heard people giving their heart to the Lord in all kinds of places. You don't have to be in the church. You can find Jesus because Jesus is right there with you. All you have to do is call out to him. Just say that prayer. Say, Lord, forgive me. I believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Come into my heart. Change my life. Change my direction. And if you've done that this morning or whenever you're, whenever you're watching this, it doesn't have to be. It can be anytime, anywhere. And if you've done that, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I, I just, I'm so excited for you. And I know that God has a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good, not of evil, and to prosper you. And if you give your heart to Christ and you surrender it, he's got a new plan. He's got from, from this day, from this day, you're forgiven and moving on. Welcome to the family. Isn't that awesome? Yes, give God praise right now. That's what you can do right there in your home. And if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you did that, Write down below, uh, right in the comments, let us know, and we can be praying for you. Write your name in there and say, hey, I've given my heart to Christ, and we'll, we'll be praying for you here at Crossroads. Our goal here at Crossroads is to make Jesus famous, not to, not to make our church famous, but to make Jesus famous. And so if you, if you want to help us spread the gospel and to reach other people and to change other lives, it's as easy as this. You can like and subscribe our channel, and you can share it with somebody. It's sharing the gospel wherever you go. God bless you. Thank you for watching again. And uh, hope you tune in again. God bless.